Good evening and Happy New Year, readers. How are you tonight? I'm glad you're here. We're on portion 12. That's a, a week 12, so we're we're making some progress here. We're just about to finish a Genesis, and um, and then we will be also looking at some other things too. If you're new, you're more than welcome to join us on the journey this winter. Uh, it doesn't matter if you just start right now. I mean, some of you are thinking, okay, I want to read the Bible this year. That's my my New Year's resolution. Well, uh, we've been we've got a little head start on you because we start in the Jewish New Year in October. But um, you're welcome to join us now because it'll it'll take you right through this, and um, and so we have um, we have a, a, cal- a reading calendar which is available. Well, is it all available mm-hmm. on um, Exploring God's Library Facebook page? And, and we're we're having a, a just a couple of. Uh, Challenges, but we won't talk too much about that. But uh, uh, we're just so glad that you're here, and we're going to be looking at uh, God's library as revealed in His library of 66 books written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The discipline of Bible reading is designed to complement your study of the Bible. Uh, it's a necessary component of your daily walk with God, along with fellowship at a local church. And it's great to read together, um, and even if you're at different places, but you're still reading the same the same uh, scriptures, and we can talk about it. Uh, this is how the Bible uh, reading program works. It's very easy. It only takes about 20 minutes a day if you read just straight through the select passages. The scriptures, also known as the Law and the Prophets, are composed of 39 books widely known as the Old Testament. The first five books are known in Hebrew as the Torah, uh, the Law, or in Greek as the Pentateuch, the Five Scrolls. Remember, the Bible was not always uh, a book like we have modern books. It was they were scrolls. They didn't have numbers on them. Didn't have chapter and verse, um, and so or pages. So it was uh, they read out of scrolls. But each day we begin by reading a portion from the Torah called a parsha. And in one year we systematically read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This re- religious reading custom uh, and calendar goes back to the sixth century B.C. It was established during the 70-year exile of the Jews to Babylon. And so it was, uh, uh, and it's still used to this day. They read from the same chapters, which makes it easier to discuss the word on a daily basis. And our calendar is is like a parsha of the New Testament and, of course, um, the Old Testament, uh, other books besides the, the Torah, the, the uh, historic books, the major and minor prophets, Additionally, we read from the wisdom literature, a psalm of the day, the same seven psalms on a weekly basis, then one of the 150 psalms. And so that way, we cover all 150 psalms twice in a year. And we'll meditate on about three verses from from Proverbs. So it's slower, but we'll get through the Proverbs in in one year. And uh, then finally, each day we read a chapter uh, from one of the 27 books of the New Testament. Every Tuesday evening, uh, we'll review our readings and provide commentary drawn from various suggested resources. If you're able not to make it at the time, we'll post a link to that on exploringgodslibrary.org. And you can please, you can please sub- hit the subscribe button for additional teaching and resources. We're going to begin by a devotional from the Valley of Vision. So maybe we can just bow our heads in prayer. Lord of Immortality, from whom angels bow and archangels veil their faces, enable us to serve you with reverence and godly fear. You who are spirit and requires truth in the inward parts, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. You who are righteous, let us not harbor sin in our heart or indulge a worldly temper or seek satisfaction in things that perish. We hasten towards an hour when earthly pursuits and possessions will appear vain when it will be indifferent whether we have been rich or poor, successful or disappointed, admired or despised, but it will be of eternal moment that we have mourned for sin, hungered and thirsted for righteousness, loved you, Lord Jesus, in sincerity, gloried in your cross. May these objects engross our chief solicitude, produce in us those principles and dispositions which make thy service perfect freedom. Expel from our minds all sinful fear and shame, so that with firmness and courage we may confess the Redeemer before men. Go forth with him bearing his reproach. Be zealous in knowledge. 
be filled with his wisdom, and walk with circumspection, ask counsel of him in all things, repair to the scriptures for his orders, stay our mind on his peace, knowing that nothing can befall us without his permission, appointment, and administration. And Lord, we we look at uh, tonight, and we've been reading through your scriptures this week, and we pray that you would illuminate the things that need to be illuminated to encourage people to, uh, through those difficult passages, or or give them more knowledge about your word, more understanding. Thank you, Lord, for this evening on this cost of discipleship. Lord, we are we are needing your your unction, your your strength, your clarity, and help us to articulate these things so people understand. Bless each reader in their circumstances. We pray that that um, this year will bring them many blessings and much growth in the spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And bless um, all the events of tonight and, and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to, um, first of all, look at... Um, First of all, we're going to look at uh, the first five books of Genesis. And, oh, can I have my, my John Davis book, Paradise of Prison? It's been a busy uh, holiday, um, and so we've got a lot to cover. In, Psalm, uh, in chapter 47, Joseph deals with the famine. Uh, Joseph uh, makes... Uh, makes Jacob take a bow to return his body, actually to, thank you, uh, 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 return his body to Canaan so he can be buried in the family um, cemetery, so to speak. And um, well, this is the book we're using, A Paradise to Prison, by John Davis, Studies in Genesis. And we've, we've uh, almost finished it up. It's very, very helpful. And so we're looking at... Um, we're looking at Joseph's vow, and also Jacob's uh, blesses his uh, his sons, because he's he's been been there for about what seventeen years. Se- seventeen years, and so um, he's finishing up his life. It's kind of a, a finishing time, and he's giving last words to his sons, and and then the sons. Of course, you you followed some of the story. I hope you've. Seen uh, that movie? Uh, you've read, first of all, read uh, the the story because it's a marvelous story of uh, redemption and and God's God's divine providence. But uh, Joseph's brothers are pretty. After Dad died, so to speak, you know, is is he going to actually be uh, pretty mean to us? Is he going to take uh, you know vengeance on us? And uh, but he reassures them he's not, and so. I'm just going to look at a little of this. You remember that um, you remember that Joseph's family is settled in the land of Goshen. The narrative returns to Joseph and the great famine. Apparently, Joseph put all the money paid for the grain into the royal treasury. And so he's a very wise administrator, and he's, he's actually uh, working with the people that are going through the famine because it's a very difficult time. And uh, they had, maybe they had animals, um, and, and then they ran out of their grain so they couldn't feed the animals. And so they, were, they needed food, and so, um, so they, they were looking to, um, to Joseph and the Pharaoh uh, for, for sustenance. And so Joseph, Joseph essentially has them, um, uh, supplies them with grain, and they they gave their animals as as a as a payment. And then when they ran out of their animals, they actually and animals and grain, they actually started. Uh, Joseph said, "Well, you can sell your land to us." And so uh, the pharaoh became a very large landowner at that period consolidated a lot of the land and because they had no 
they had no other way to uh, survive. But through that seven years of famine, uh, and because of the wise, wise uh, uh, administrative capability of Joseph, who had, under God's direction, had saved up you know, the produce from seven years of plenty. And so um, the, the nation and others are, are able to withstand the, the famine. So, so he bartered, uh, he permitted the grain to be bartered for such things as cattle, horses, and flocks. And, um, and to survive. And then Joseph uh, makes a prom- Joseph's promise to Jacob is that uh, if Jacob really wanted um, him to be bur- you know, his body to be buried in, in the land of, of um, Canaan. And so he, he does something that's very traditional. He puts his hand under Jacob's thigh, a solemn symbol that the oath was binding even after Jacob's death. Joseph swore to bury Jacob in Canaan, his homeland. Um, and he realized that the sojourn of his family in Egypt was temporary and that God would redeem them, return them to the promised land. So that was really important. And then uh, he's getting towards the end of his life and he, he bows low, signifies his gesture of appreciation, the part of, of a bedridden man near the point of death because he was very close to death. So Jacob does a blessing on his sons, and um, the writer of Hebrews chose Jacob's blessing of Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, as his outstanding act of faith. Remember, that's the uh, Hall of Hebrew, uh, Heroes. It's about the promises. And Jacob's clear faith in God's covenant promises and his sensitivity to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. It's no accident that Moses referred to Jacob as Israel in the latter part of verse 2. As Israel, he was a bearer of the covenant promises of God. As Jacob, he was only a human warrior, feeble with age and near death. Israel began by reminding Joseph that God Almighty had appeared to him in Canaan and assured him a future blessing. So they're really important. Um, It's it's the covenant that's uh, being passed on. When Ephraim and Manasseh were brought before him, Jacob formally adopted them as his own sons. There's a slight touch of irony here since Jacob has secured Isaac's blessings by guile and deceit, while Joseph is securing the blessing for his sons by honesty and forthrightness. The age of Jacob, unable to recognize his grandsons, had them identified. Then Jacob deliberately placed his right hand upon their younger son, Ephraim, for the firstborn blessing. Remember, he got the firstborn blessing, but it was through deceit. But, and his left hand upon Manasseh. This is the first mention of the imposition of hands as a symbol of blessing. A similar procedure was later employed to dedicate priests and still later to ordain church officers. Uh, Manasseh would also be a great nation. Uh, Ephraim, as a firstborn, he he's going to be great too. And Jacob gave complete priority to God's will in the whole matter. Jacob's blessing on Ephraim began to realize fulfillment during the time of the judges. Um, the tribe of Ephraim had increased in number and power to the point that it exercised leadership among the northern ten tribes. Jacob concluded with a promise that Joseph would ultimately return to Canaan and occupy a portion of land which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword. And, and so he's giving these promises. So I hope you're reading that, and it's very, very important. Uh, and then a large segment of Old Testament scholars consistently reject the idea of predictive prophecy, um, but... Um, Early predictive texts like Genesis 49 to mere historical notices written after the fact. To those who cannot accept prediction, the oracles of this chapter are, are vaccinia ex eventubus, prophecies fabricated from the events they appear to foresee. Because the events are widely separated, the speech then must be broken down into a string of sayings uttered over the centuries. But taken as a genuine vision of Jacob is its variable range presents no difficulty. There is no reason why the curtain should fall at the same point for all the tribes, every reason why it should not. There has been widespread discussion and debate regarding this chapter's origin, language, and significance. Much of the debate centers around some obscure words and phrases in the text. The whole prophecy is introduced by the important phrase, in the last days. This indicates that the forthcoming utterances concerned that which will befall the tribes. So he's talking about what's going to befall the tribes in the future. 
Um, so I look at that uh, Reuben. Reuben. Uh, so he's going to, going to the family, and it's he began with um, Jacob began with the feeling of great joy, remembering that Reuben was the firstborn, and the excellency of dignity, and the excellence of his power. Then Jacob recalled Reuben's fornication, and the with Bela, his father's concubine, which disqualifies him from the firstborn blessing. Jacob described his character as unstable as water. You wouldn't want that, would you? Um, and so then uh, with the rights of the firstborn went to the leadership of Israel. And history demonstrates that Reuben's tribe never significantly influences the nation. Not one prominent personality descended from Reuben. Very interesting. And Simeon he didn't like, he, he was, didn't give this blessing very good, um, didn't give them a great blessing. The wicked violence of Simeon and Levi against the inhabitants of Shechem was never forgotten by Jacob. Jacob's anger at their unrestrained treachery in Shechem were identified, were identical. Jacob's anger at their um, their lack of moral judgment on a story told earlier without comment. Jacob prophesied that both tribes would experience division and dispersion, which they did. When Moses blessed the tribes, he omitted Simeon. By God's grace and providence, however, Levi received 48 cities scattered throughout the lands allotted to other tribes. Those are the priestly cities. While in the wilderness, Levi's descendants alone had stood for, which, for that which was right in Exodus. By Mosaic appointment, they were scattered through the tribes as teachers and instructors in the law. In spite of the division and dispersion by, of Simeon and Levi, both will enter the Messianic kingdom, according to Ezekiel 44 and Revelation 7. Then Judah, you know, Jesus from the line of the tribe of Judah. The blessings of Judah are longer and more eloquent than any except Joseph's. It contains some obscure expressions and the word Shiloh, continues to be uh, hotly debated. Judah, it will be remembered, had engineered the sale of Joseph into slavery and wrong, wrong, wronged his daughter-in-law, Tamar. However, by this time, both sins had been expiated. The phrase, his hand would be upon the neck of the enemies, indicates that Judah's tribe would succeed in warfare and its success as a matter of record. The heart of Judah's prophecy was a promise that the, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The scepter, of course, was the symbol of royal power, and in its earliest form was long, a long staff, which the king held by his hand when speaking to public assemblies. On the contrary, this term denotes the turning point to which the superiority of Judah will continue, not then to cease, but at that time to be enlarged so as to embrace all the nations. The term Shiloh has been variously translated tribute to him, ruler or counselor. And then since the word connotes place of rest, it would designate Judah, if not Messiah himself, as the one characterized by rest uh, proceeding. The, so that's, he's a Messiah. Shiloh is a proper name for the coming Messiah. This is a traditional interpretation by both Jewish and Christian writers. The scepter, scepter's association with the tribe of Judah seems to conform to other messianic promises. Um, and Shiloh refers to the lion that is of the tribe of Judah. Well, then you have Zebulun, and then, so I just encourage you, read, read there the blessings that are very important. Then Jacob's death and burial. Um, Jacob requested he be buried in the cave that Abraham had purchased from Ephraim the, uh, the Hittite, where Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, and Leah were already buried. And uh, I think I showed some, we, we actually posted some pictures uh, in a little video of that area um, some time ago. Joseph's tender affection for his father's expressed in the words, Joseph fell under his father's face and went upon him and kissed him. He immediately commanded his servants to secure physicians to embalm Jacob's body, and this was done. And it's very interesting. Um, uh, there's, I think, a Genesis, uh, which is a, a ministry, had actually got pictures of the place where the tomb was, um, Joseph's tomb, 
in in Egypt, and um, and then it, but it was empty, and it actually had a picture, a little paint of um, of him on there of a man with many many uh, a coat with many colors, which you uh, immediately which you would immediately uh, attest to uh, to Joseph and his coat of many colors, um, and then. So then Joseph's last day. Um, but as for you, you thought evil. That's that whole scripture about. Uh, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. This is one of the clearest declarations of divine providence anywhere in scripture. It serves as an important reminder that while the evil of men may appear to be uh, for dis- disadvantage. Of, of the saints, the purpose and plans of God will ultimately prevail. Joseph died at 130, which Egyptians consider an ideal age. Um, what I have done on earth is not inconsiderable. In I attained 110 years of life, which the king gave me with favor, foremost among his ancestors, though doing right for the king up to this point of veneration. No less than 27 were references discovered in Egyptian text. So it's talked about. Well, anyway, that this gives you a little bit of um, a picture of the ending. It's very good, very important. Um, okay, now we're going to look at Kings. And um, I was, um, I mean, looking at Kings is... Uh, the story of Solomon is a remarkable story. I was just telling Elizabeth uh, a while ago, I said, I mean, this guy, um, if we had tabloids today, he'd be on every tabloid. I and mean, we had 700 wives. Very, <laughs> very interesting story, this man, this man lived. Uh, I was looking at um, a book. It's called The Evangelical Commentary on the Bible by Elwell, by Baker. Baker, it's very good. I'm going to just give you a little bit of a a look at this. Um, Kylan Delich does a more um, verse by verse job, but this gives you kind of a picture of some of the things that are happening. I think it's very important to get get a picture of what's happening in this man's very busy life. Um, and also, <clears throat> where what's what are the source materials? This is one of the things we ask these questions, right? Who wrote these things? Uh, what is the source material, um, um, what time period, etc. And uh, they talk about when did, did the writer take up his pen. The most satisfying reply to the questions can be derived from Scripture. It looks like uh, it was the year 37 in, in Jehoiakim's uh, exile. And he had been taken into exile during the second deportation 597 to 596, that was a deportation from Jerusalem to Babylon. Um, what kind of source material, um, if any, did the writer of Kings have available? It could be argued that as an inspired writer, he did not need sources. Also, as an exile living far from Jerusalem, he could not acquire sources. So there's no library available, um, at least at that time it was close. But as an exile living far from Jerusalem, um, the Lord moved the writer to employ sources which had evidently been gathered and taken to Babylon. When they took sources, they take the the intelligence, the intelligentsia, of the, the elite in the exile. And so um, what he did is he, um, he along with the 10,000 captives, the officers, army men, craftsmen, artisans, and the royal families, um, the writer refers to these sources and by name. One, the book of Annals of Solomon. Second, the book of the Annals of the Kings of Israel, referred to 17 times in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and the book of Annals of the Kings of Judah, referred to 15 times. So this is like their, um, the scribes that write what's going on in, in the, the king's lives and the prophets. So he's drawing from them. Those are the, the sources. And then, um, um, and so we're looking at uh, some of the things we've looked at before, but we're 
we're looking at um, kind of the ending of David's, King David's life. And, and it was talking about the fact that after a very strenuous life, he is, he is unable to reign anymore at the age of 70 years. He's had a very busy life as a warrior and uh, taking, taking uh, you know, you know, from a very young age. And then even, even towards the end of his life, they, um, they, and he still has vigor, but they're thinking, well, he needs heat, and, and maybe um, this beautiful young virgin Abishag from the Shunamen in the tribe of Issachar uh, would help him you know, be aroused, uh, he'd be warm, but um, he isn't aroused. And, but she ministers to him as a nurse and uh, helps him through this end of his life. And of course, Adonijah, he's the, David's oldest living son. He attempts to become king. It didn't work out so well. We talked about that a little bit last week. And so if you look at this, it's, it's quite, quite intriguing. I mean, the, 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 court, the court battles, the intrigues that are going on, um, something that uh, you want to look at. Um, so it seems that um, I think we did talk quite a bit about this last time but David calls for his three trusted men when, when Adonijah was usurping the throne and he called Nathan the, he's the prophet from the prophetic order and Benaiah a military and captain of David's bodyguard and the military forces and David was still pretty sharp I even though he was, uh, he was, you know, his energy and his, he was dying. He made specific instructions to indicate David is very alert. One, men who were served David are to be, are to accompany him, and the royal mule is to carry Solomon because Solomon is going to become king, and Solomon is to be brought to Gibeon, the spring just uh, east of Jerusalem. Zadok and Nathan are to anoint Solomon. Five, the trumpet announcing the event is to be blown. Six, the proclamation, long live King Solomon, is to be shouted. And seven, Solomon is to be brought to the palace and place on the throne. These instructions are supported by the king's declaration. I have appointed him. Ben and I have pronounced his blessing on the decisive action by expanding, expressing the hope that the Lord will be with and do ever, ever, even more for Solomon than he has done for David. And David thus receives assurance that his orders will be carried out, and he has the support of the military forces, which is really important, and um, especially in leadership transition. A lot of leadership uh, lessons here. Um, and then, of course, he, he gives out very specific commands to Solomon about taking care of his enemies. Very important, because he had to consolidate power within, within the kingdom, and, and he knew that there were some people that were causing him problems. One was Joab, who had brought blood on, on the kingdom because of his murder of Ahab and Amasa. And then, uh, so that had to be removed. And then, and then also um, he had to deal with Shimei, who cursed David. And, and these were not matters of him taking personal revenge on these people. They were, he knew that these would be these people would be continuing problems, and there was no repentance in them. And he gave them opportunities, so he was he was giving them grace, but they didn't take take advantage of it. And then um, even the priests that were um, that were that were under that had been co-opted by Adonijah um, had uh, been removed and uh, banished to a rural area, and so Nathan and took over. And Zadok, and then um, um, as as we as you read through, you're going to see that there some some evidence of Solomon's moral and spiritual double-mindedness and present, because Solomon marries a spiritual prin a princess from Egypt, and of course that was already in the family in some ways because of uh, Joseph and his um, his wife was a. A daughter of a priest in in Egypt, so there's a lot of this syncretism, and so, and then of course it expands to his horses, you know, buying horses, and then you know into seven hundred wives and their 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 needs and their their other gods, and so he starts, I mean he he does go through a period where he's 
still making offerings to God. God's still pleased with his offerings. And, uh, but as that, as, uh, you know, was evidenced by his, his sincere faith and making those offerings, you know, God even talks about what do you need? And he said, I need wisdom to, you know, manage such a, a great people. And, um, and you start looking at that and you go, wow, it takes a lot of wisdom to manage our own little lives, let alone, you know, a, a life, lives of a kingdom and, and, um, and with so much wealth and so much influence and so many uh, foreign allegiances, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's a total amazing study just to look at this man's life. I mean, he had, he had knowledge of so many proverbs. He had knowledge of so many plants. Um, he was, he was a, like a veritable dictionary or encyclopedia of, of plants and, and wisdom. And um, so he, he's very, he, he, he loved wisdom from the very beginning, but God gave him more. And then with that, gave him so many more. He didn't ask for a long life, but God gave him a long life and, you know, established his kingdom and uh, wouldn't you know, replace it until after his death. And then, uh, of course, he has a son, Rehoboam, who usurps the throne. We'll talk about that later. Not today, though. And um, so uh, Solomon appoints 12 district governors. So he's setting up governor, governorships over all the area and uh, making provision for the royal household. They have to give so much per month. And then uh, he also, um, his kingdom, it gets pretty established and he has, he has um, indentured servants. He also has slaves. And, um, and so some of these slaves are used in the, the building projects, which is pretty wise if you think about uh, you know, what happened in America in, um, under under uh, President Delano Roosevelt when they had the uh, Civil Conservation Corps, a lot of people were put to work. I mean, they got paid, but um, we have a lot, of, a lot of proof of these amazing projects that, that were used in the country. And so Solomon was a, a builder. So he, he built a temple. He, he built a palace, his own palace. He built uh, uh, this, uh, you know, the, the, the Solomon's Pillars, all sorts of things that took about 13 years of building. So he was constantly building. And so we can also read about how the temple was built. And the temple, the building of the temple is, a, is something that's just very interesting, especially if you're, if you're familiar with architecture or any of these things. I mean, he's, he's, um, uh, he's working with, he's working with uh, people that he had known before or his father had built alliances with in the... Um, uh, early, early, earlier days, and so he he started when he was uh, he was building a temple in the fourth year of his his, uh, his reign, and and much of the um, oh, its point is made of the fact that all the timbers and blocks of stone are prepared before they are brought to Mount Moriah, where the temple is built. I thought that's fascinating. Thus, all the the parts only have to be fitted together. Hammers, axes, and saws are not needed. They're not seen or heard or handled at the construction site. So they kept it very quiet, maybe for a long time. And, um, and so God also assures him that he will keep his covenant he made with David and Israel. Okay, so uh, Solomon builds this royal palace and also... Um, I mean, the, the city was a, a place of splendor. I mean, millions of, I mean, millions of dollars, uh, billions, a um, lot of lot of gold. Um, and fascinating is that, um, that let me find that. Oh, can I have the other um, the other? Uh, it's the uh, the kingdom. John Davis and John Wickham, that Israel, the kingdom. It should be over there. Because I brought it in. I read it earlier. Um, I just wanted to read this one part to you about uh, how... Um... Oh, it's not there? Okay. I don't think I have it over here. Um, about his his navy, I didn't know he had a navy, uh, but he had uh, he had a navy, and he also 
uh, had uh, like quarries where he he was um, doing doing things in these wadis and and um, do you see it? No. Hmm. Okay. Well, we we'll, we we'll might get back to that in a minute. Okay. If you could keep looking for... Oh, here it is. It's behind my computer. I've been also reading uh, John J. Davis and John C. Win, uh, Whitcomb on, on commentary on Joshua to Kings. Very, very helpful. And um, Solomon had commercial enterprises. Uh, Solomon had an extensive fleet of ships located... Ezion Geber, which is located on the Gulf of Aqaba. Probably you've heard about Aqaba, uh, which is in, I think, uh, Saudi, uh, in Lawrence of Arabia, and, and probably also, um, of course, you know, the Red Sea, because it's the area. And so, biblical Ezion Geber indicates that it was not only extensively occupied in the days of Solomon, but was used as a smelting operation. And so they had well-built structures of high floors designed and used either as a storehouse or granary. And we should like to underscore the fact that industrial and metallurgic activities did indeed take place in the various periods of occupation. Copper slag was definitely found in the excavations as well as remnants of copper implements and vessels. And of course, these are very important in making weapons. Remember, for a long time, the Philistines had total control of, uh, of the iron, iron which was used in weapons, and you'd have to take your your implements and get them sharpened by the Philistines. So that was that was their way of arms control, and so um, so as time went on, you know that uh, that was taken over, and then um, a new light has been also shed on the nature of Solomon's navy, or the fleet of Tarshish. Recent studies have indicated that the Navy of Solomon was, in fact, specialized uh, smeltery or refinery fleet, which was responsible for bringing smelted metal home from the colonial mines. So he's he's uh, he's a wise king. He's he's doing a lot of commerce. We don't really think about the extent of this man's wealth and his commerce and his relationships with others. And the Phoenicians were also uh, probably very much engaged in this activity. In addition to carrying slag and metal, metal materials, Solomon's ships also went to Ophir. This was carried out in collaboration with Hiram, king of Tyre, and Retire. And the term Ophir probably includes most of the regions of South Arabia and was commonly associated with the production of fine gold in the Old Testament. Solomon was able to strengthen his ties with the Arabian merchants by virtue of the Visit of the Queen of Sheba, or by the Queen of Sheba, and um, who you know saw that they heard about, they had heard from afar about Solomon's wisdom. Of course, a lot of things travel, um, wisdom and news travels through the trade routes. I mean, they didn't have uh, the internet at the time, um, but they had they had trade routes, and so they would uh, wisdom would come through those trade routes. And then um, Solomon's merchant fleet came under such distant places as distant places as Africa, Arabia, and parts of the Mediterranean world. Trading, he was very much in trading horses. He was a horse trader, which he wasn't supposed to do. It's one of the things. Many of the purchases made were probably probably for his own armies, but he also was into arms uh, dealing. Uh, he made uh, he provided horses and chariots for other countries as maybe he's a middleman, a broker for commercial in negotiations. I mean, he is very wise. And then the, um, then of course, uh, he, he starts to face apostasy. You know, and this is chapter 11, this is further. But uh, really emphasizes that we are supposed to choose our alliances caref- carefully or they will influence your spiritual life. Okay, well that's all I'm going to do on kings. Okay, um, of course you have Hiram and then 
You also have Hurum. Hurum was that the the spirit filled um, man who who made copper uh, copper did a lot of copper work and everything. It's a very beautiful thing. Um, and then, um, okay. So let's see if there's anything in here. Of course, there was a feast for the dedication of the temple. You know, Solomon's prayer is really very impressive. And Solomon's blessing and sacrifice and God's covenant with a vision with Solomon. And the Queen of Sheba I mentioned. And, um, and there's, he's, still, he's still consolidating his kingdom too. Okay, let's move on to the New Testament. Um, wow. It's very exciting to read this. I mean, I wish I had more time to personally to just read and study uh, Luke. Now, um, I'm you know, privileged because uh, I did, Elizabeth and I did sit, sit in a teaching of John MacArthur as he preached through Luke. I don't know how many chapters, or how many how long he was in Luke, but he's in Luke for a long time. I mean, there's so many, so many, um, so many stories here, you know, and we're just looking at 9 through 17 right now, uh, where he sends out the 12, Herod seeks Jesus, feeding the, uh, the 12, um, the, the 5,000, and um, where Jesus predicts his death and resurrection, and remember his transfiguration, I mean, so many things here. And I'm going to just jump ahead to a couple things. One is where Jesus is, um, uh, is asking, or he's asking his disciples in um, uh, 9, where he's talking about, um, he's asking his disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? He wanted to know that. And I have posted something for you. Uh, on exploring God's library, which is quite interesting. It's, um, we have much on the 1893 Parliament of the World's Religions, and part of our donation to Biola Library contains a two-volume set of the speeches delivered there. I also discovered a second set. The interfaith movement traces its origin to the 1893 Parliament, and I think that, uh, that it was when religion came into America pretty heavily through through uh, Hindus and Buddhists. And so I read some of these documents and uh, there weren't many people that could address them because they didn't really understand world religions very well in America and worldwide. But um, uh, Jesus asked a question to his disciples in Luke 9, 18 through 20. He says, who do men say that I am? And he says, and it happened as he was alone praying, that his disciples joined him and he asked them saying, who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah. John the Baptist resurrected because um, he had his head cut off. Uh, others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. Now we had, we had, we had um, gone with a small team to the parliament in, in 1993 at the Chicago Palmer Hilton Hotel. And uh, there were about 6,000 religious leaders from all over the globe, including the Dalai Lama, Louis Farrakhan, um, and many others, including Christians like James Beverly, Mahendra Singhal, Jerry Yamamoto, Erwin Lutzer, Moody Bible Church, Brant Pelfrey, Areopagus Magazine. And this um, parliament was um, quite interesting because we were asking the Buddhists about who do you say that I am, and Muslims. And so you'll see in the, the, the playlist, it's quite interesting, um, you you understand oh different people's viewpoints you know the 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 Muslims the Mormons the 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 Jains the Sikhs and and others and so it's very very helpful and so um, why do I even post that I think it's I think it gives you an example a real world example of what you were talking to Buddha so what do you actually think because some people say oh everybody believes in God well it's not true um, and 
And in the parliament, the 1893 parliament, they pointed it out quite readily. And also in the 1993 parliament, they point out quite readily, we're not Christians. And so Jesus is, is training them. You know, who are these people? Who do they really think I am? Because Jesus was doing all sorts of miracles, right? And we think about Luke, you know, the great physician, or the physician who's um, writing this, this, um, this history down of all the things that Christ has done. And you'll see so many things about him healing the lunatics, healing the woman with, with um, you know, the blood, the blood for twelve years that spent all of her savings on 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 um, on physicians, and so uh, Luke, this Luke is so packed with such vital and encouraging information, because Christ sends out his disciples to work miracles and to preach, and um, and then. He, uh, he also teaches us to pray, you know, um, you know, the Lord's Prayer. We don't really have time tonight, but I wanted to get into a little bit of a devotion because I, um, uh, with um, uh, the Lord's Prayer, which is uh, written by um, uh, Thomas Watson, and it's excellent because it goes through who is our Lord, uh, what is it to, and this is it, the Lord's Prayer. It's an excellent, excellent uh, an understandable resource. He was uh, 1620 to 1686, was one of the most popular preachers in London during the Puritan era. His writings are marked with clarity uh, and spiritual uh, richness. Nowhere is this seen so clearly as in the uh, exposition of the Shorter Catechism drawn up by the Westminster Assembly and the three-volume edition of which this is the third. Makes an ideal guide to Christian doctrine and practice also serves as a wonderful introduction of Puritan literature. And he also has um, a book on the Ten Commandments and also on the body of divinity. And it, he really gets deeply into it. I, I can't really spend much time on it right now, but it's excellent. Um, and then I'm just going to, there's also in, in Luke 13, the Tower of Siloam, um, and the, very important, and repentance. And the cost of discipleship in Luke 14. And remember, okay, in, in Luke 13, uh, the Galileans are frequently mentioned by Josephus as the most turbulent and seditious people, being upon all occasions ready to disturb the Roman authority. It is uncertain to what extent our Lord refers, but it's probable that they were the followers of Judas Galonitus, who opposed paying tribute to Caesar, the tax revolt, and submitting to the Roman government which is a religious uh, submission, because they're saying, you know, you have to bow to Caesar and you know, swear allegiance to him as God. A party of them were coming to Jerusalem during one of the great festivals and presenting their oblations in the court of the temple. Pilate treacherously sent a company of soldiers who slew them and mingled their blood with their sacrifices. This is an abomination because, you know, it's like it's not, it's not, not to slay these people. And, and Jesus really addresses this. And he, he says, Suppose ye that these Galatians were sinners above all the Galilean, or Galilean, Galileans, rather, because they suffered such things? And he says, Nay, I tell you, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And there was also another, like a tower collapse, kind of like the bridges collapsed in, in Korea or, or, or the uh, World Trade Center. Um, you think there were sinners above all that dwelt in Jerusalem the, because they, they died in this tower or in the Twin Towers or even, even October 7th? Do you think that they're, that we're, they're worse sinners than us? And Jesus just used these things and he said, Nay, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So he's calling us to repent. And um, so... The scriptures are very rich in these areas. I'm moving through this quite quickly because they're... Okay. I want to now um, jump ahead into a seriousness of discipleship, Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father or mother and wife, children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He's really looking at the cost of discipleship. 
And whoever doth not bear his cross, come after me, cannot be my disciple. It's a seriousness. Um, and then, of course, there's a prodigal son. A great story. There's always hope for people. And then also the, je- the jealousy of people that serve God and don't go astray. Jealousy of those that come in. You know, that, um, you know the, the son, I mean, he got very, the, the younger son said, Your bro- my brother's come and you have killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. He was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father and said, and treated him. And he answered, said to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee. Never, neither transgressed I at any time like commandments, and yet thou never gavest me a kid, a, you know, a, a feast, that I might make merry with my friends. Kids are young goats. I don't know if you've ever had caprito, but it's very good. It's excellent. Um, and as soon as the son, but as soon as your son came, which devoured thy living with harlots, has killed, because remember he gave him his inheritance, um, you sacrificed a cow. Thou, but he said, the, the prodigal father said, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was, it was important that I should make merry and be glad, for this bro- brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. And it's an important lesson for us all. Fa- the thing about these relationships is that the family relationships are very difficult. It's very instructive. Okay, I'm going to move on from here. There's so much more to say. Um, we're not going to do Psalms except that in Psalm 78. Um, can you bring over Psalm 78? It's uh, page um, 332. I just want to read something from it because I think it's very important. It struck me. And this is from the Treasure of David um, by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And, and he, um, he basically says, I like this. He said, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. So it's, how does faith come? It comes from by the hearing of the word, right? When God gives his truth a tongue and sends forth his messengers, trained to declare his word with power, it is, le- it is the least we can do to give them our ears and the earnest obedience of our hearts. Men lend their ears to music. How much more then should they listen to the harmonies of the gospel? It's an exhortation. Inclining the ears does not denote any ordinary sort of hearing, but such as a disciple renders to the words of his master. Careful hearing with submission and reverence of mind, silent and earnest, that whatever is enunciated for the purpose of instruction may be heard and properly understood, nothing be allowed to escape. He is a hearer of a different stamp when, who hears carelessly, not for the purpose of learning or imitation, but to criticize, to make, to make merry, to indulge an, uh, animosity, or to kill time. So, you know, really be intent on hearing. It's one of the, it's one of the least practice skills there is. I mean, if you ever tried to speak with people and they don't want to hear you, hey, you, the the whole group the whole group loses. But if we all work together and we're intent on hearing something, then the best comes out. Okay, Doctrine of the Week, Providence, The Mystery of Providence by John Flavel. I love that book, and I did. We did post uh, John Flavel on on our reading. A list curriculum for this week, so it is it is uh, digital. You can go to a place and read it. I recommend it. Um, but before we discuss divine providence, let's out define a miracle. According to Dr. John MacArthur in his book The Essential Doctrines, which is very helpful, the Bible defines a miracle as God's suspension of the ordinary workings of providence, so as to act directly and supernaturally. Let's say that again. The Bible defines a miracle as God's suspension of the ordinary workings of providence so as to act directly and supernaturally. 
And there's evidently four different Hebrew words in the Old Testament that reveal various shades of meaning, uh, of miracle. Pele has a, uh, the basic idea of wonder, and it's not, uh, it's not Pele, the, uh, the, you know, the famous uh, soccer star, although he is a wonder, um, but it has the idea of wonder. And ought indicates a sign that establishes certainty. Guburu means strength, sign, or port, portent, or might. Mofet basically means wonder, pointing to a work as in Jesus healed the woman with the blood disease, right? Or as in the virgin birth. So it's, it's a work that comes through. Like the in, Jesus said, I felt like energy was leaving my body. Who touched me? And, uh, and the woman was healed, right? And so a lot of the miracles you'll see, they're, they're when the energy goes from God's body. Uh, MacArthur then turns his attention to divine providence. And uh, I mentioned virgin birth, right? I mean, the Holy Spirit came in. So that's supernatural. Mar MacArthur then turns his attention to divine providence, which he defines as God's preserving his creation, operating in every event in the world, and directing the things in the universe to his appointed end for them. God's providence is meticulous, encompassing the grandest and minutest aspects of life, the universe as a whole, in the physical realm. And as we mentioned before, Genesis 5, 50, 20. So he ended up uh, Genesis. You, what did Joseph say? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Divine providence, um, God's observing his, preserving his creation, general and specific, um, Your, your, who, who you have in your family. Um, the mystery of providence, a drunk drummer awakes a people. Somebody starts playing drum. Why did they all get up? I can't even remember what it would, would happen. But uh, how about David, King David, when he was being chased by, by King Saul, he hides in a cave, but a spider's web covers the cave. And he and his men are, um, are protected from Saul's discovery because of the webs that went over the cave. And I love this one. This, I was looking for this, uh, this story on uh, Flavel, and he comments in Divine Providence and mentions the seventh challenge at some point to. And they're, they're saying, well, well, wait a minute. What is Divine Providence? If these things are contingent, meaning occurring or existing only if certain circumstances are the, the case, depending on the resolution of the conflict, um, and... Okay, what does contingent mean? It's a big word. It means depending on certain circumstances. In real estate, when a house is listed as contingent, it means that an offer has been made and accepted, but before the deal is complete, some additional criteria must be met. The roof must be prepared or down payment must be made, credit must be approved. How is it they, that these circumstances fall out so remarkably in the nick and junctures of time? The God is there, which makes them so greatly observable to all who consider them. We find a multitude of providences so timed to a minute that he, had they occurred just a little sooner or later, they would have mattered little in comparison with what they do now. Certainly, it cannot be chance, but counsel that so exactly works in time. God's in control. Contingencies keep no, to no rules. How remarkable to this purpose were the tidings brought to the angel who calls to Abraham and shows him another sacrifice just when his hand was about to deliver the fatal stroke to Isaac. Remember, he's had the, gun, had the, the knife is going to sacrifice his son because God commanded, and the angel stops him and says, Oh, God has provided the lamb. It's in the thicket. Um, so a well of water is shown to Hagar, who, when she had just left the child, Ishmael, not being able to watch its death. Um, and then... When Haman's plot against the Jews was ripe and all things were ready for execution, they had already made the, the gallows and everything, that very night the king couldn't sleep. And what does he run into? He runs in, well, Mordecai did. He, um, he revealed the plot that those people were going to kill him. And so he does something great for, for Mordecai. But was, everything was God's perfect timing. And then... Um, there was also a story there was Mr. Dodd could not go to bed one night but had a strong impulse to visit 
though unseasonably, a neighbor, a neighbor's, a neighboring gentleman, and just as he came there, he meets his neighbor at his door with a halter in his pocket, just going to hang himself. So interesting. Happened to my dad too. You know, it was a, he was a um, a man who was um, a, a a GI who was pretty depressed and was about to shoot shoot himself in the head. And my dad uh, showed showed up because he was just obedient and and God used him. And uh, and so you know he didn't kill himself. The dad was able to minister to him. A good woman from who it says a good woman. There was another thing about. Um, this guy, Dr. Tate and his wife in the Irish Rebellion, they were fleeing through the woods with a suckling child which was just about ready to die. The mother going to rest, rest the baby on a rock puts her hand upon a bottle of warm milk. How'd that show up? Which, was, which, which preserved the child. A good woman from whose mouth I received it, being driven to the great extremity, all supplies failing, was plunged into unbelieving doubts and fears, not seeing where supplies could come from. When out of just in the nick of time, turning over some things in a chest, she unexpectedly lights upon a piece of gold, which supplied her present needs till God opened another door of supply. If these things fall out by accident, how is it they come in the very nick of time? So exactly that it has become pro- proverbial in Scripture, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And I've had that. Amazing. I was speaking about gold. Um, I had a a man who came over I was witnessing to, and he used to be a chef. He cooked for the king of Denmark, and um, one he had a dog named Falsen, and and uh, a Doberman, and the kids used to walk walk him around. They were like so short, and he was tall, but nobody ever feared the dog, but not the kids. Um, but uh, uh, Jens had gone to a place in Pasadena, uh, near art center and he said I lost my gold filling I have a $900 gold filling in my mouth and I lost it when I was walking my dog he said would you come come and help me and I said sure so um, told the kids let's go on a a, a treasure hunt so we went down there and we were we had a little shovel and a little little rake and we were looking and down on our knees and we were looking around for this $900 gold filling. He said, it fell right here. And so uh, as we were going through, we, we prayed. And we usually pray, you know, when we lose something, you know, God, God seems to take pleasure in finding things, you help us find things. And, uh, and so I was on my knees and I asked the Lord, I said, no, I didn't even ask the Lord. I asked the Lord before, you know, to help us find it. But I was on my knees and just ask you, was this a miracle or was this providence? Because I still, it's still um, a mysterious thing, event for me. Because I was on my knees and I looked over and I said, and to the end, I said, God said it's not here, it's in your car. <laughs> now he had driven his own car and he said, what? I said, yeah, it's not here. He said, it's in the car. So I walked over to the car and this is 100% truth, the kids can attest to it. And I go over and sit in the car in the driver's seat, and I just took my hand. Now, this is just the Holy Spirit's direction. Put my hand in between the seats, you know, in between seats. I mean, you've cleaned your car. I mean, I had so many things, popcorn, french fries, you know, stuff. It's really disgusting. And I put my hand straight down, and I touched this thing and picked it up, and it was a gold filling, $900 gold filling. He was amazed. Um, it to demonstrate God, right? God's care. And so, is that a miracle or providence? I've had people say, well, you know, unless it's in the Word, you know, you know God doesn't speak. And I said, well, He did to me. So, um, pretty amazing. Okay, let's look at uh, the mark of the week, cost of discipleship. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dean Dietrich Bonhoeffer is... I read this in Erdman's book on Christian classics and also have been reading uh, Stephen Nichols' excellent book on Bonhoeffer. He was one of the most key Christian figures around the Second World War, um, and this is his brief bio. In December 1939, a Lutheran pastor and lecturer in theology was on a lecture tour in America. 
Already he was known as the enemy of the Nazi regime in his native Germany. He had denounced Hitler on the radio in 1933 before he came to power. He had spent two years in London urging the German congregation there to join the battle against Nazism. And in 1936, he had been banned by the Nazis for speaking, writing, or lecturing. He had also written two influential books, The Cost of Discipleship and Living Together. I read Living Together, excellent book about community. And his reputation as a radical Christian thinker was growing. If he stayed in America, he would be safe and sound. He could pursue his studies. Instead, he chose to return to Germany taking one of the last ships to sail before the war broke out. After four years of resistance work, he was finally arrested for his part in an attempt to assassinate history. And he talks about this, I think, in his book, Ethics. On April 9, 1945, only a short time before the end of the war, he was hanged. His letters and papers from prison, published after his death, show a man who thought deeply about what Christianity means in the modern world and who lived out his faith to the end with unfailing courage. He is known for writing on, on cheap grace and costly grace. Here's a brief snippet. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline, something lacking in the church today. Communion without confession. Absolution without public confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. People don't get discipled. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Costly grace is a treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves the nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel, which must be sought again and again. The gift which must be um, the gift which was me I must have missed Brown or copy something for the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it follow, calls us to follow. It is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God his, the life of his son. You were bought at a price, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. In Stephen Nichols' Bonhoeffer, he spends a chapter on the Word in which he says, Those who have accepted God's Word must begin to seek God, for they can do no other. In 1943, he wrote from Tingle Prison, I read, meditate, write, pace up and down my cell without rubbing myself sore against the walls like a polar bear. I'm reading the Bible straight through from cover to cover. That's what we're doing. He writes, Christians are people of the book. Any theology of the Christian life, any spirituality, must always trace back to and derive from Scripture. It alone abides while everything else, our techniques, our seminars, our leaders, fade, fails, and passes. He had an orthodox view of Christ. He believed that an orthodox Christology is a robust basis for living the Christian life. What does, what does that consist of? Believing that Christ is the God-man who alone provides redemption through his atoning work on the cross and holding to a high view of Scripture as God's only authoritative word. Orthopraxy flows from orthodoxy. What is the definition of orthodoxy? It conforms to the Christian faith as formulated in the early ecumenical creeds and confessions. The things that we're we're trying to understand, doctrines. What is orthopraxy? Orthopraxis is said to mean right glory or right worship. Only correct or proper practice, particularly correct worship, is understood as establishing the fullness of glory given to God. This is one of the primary purposes of liturgy, divine labor, the work of the people. It is said in the Westminster Shorter Catechism that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The Word of God which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Once Bonhoeffer discovered the Bible, he read it. His reading of the Bible, which for him meant 
necessarily taking his claims seriously, led him to the life he lived. Eventually it led him, as he understood his obedience to his claims on his life, to his martyrdom. Bonhoeffer grew up in the context of liberalism and was under the influence of a liberal theologian historian, Adolf Harnack, who was a, really a disciple of Marcion. He understood the context he was in. And, and in that context, the Marcion, they were getting rid of the Old Testament. They didn't believe in the Old Testament God. They thought he was different than the New Testament God. And it's still it's influencing our own teachings these days. We must ask ourselves, what context have we grown up in? What We have grown up in a pluralistic context, which is multicultural, hedonistic, syncretistic. We do all, oh, I do yoga, I do this, I do that, I believe in Buddhist this and Buddhist that, or, or I'm, you know, believe a little bit in Islam, or we, we mix everything up. And so we're influenced by other doctrinal positions which may not be scriptural, like open theism. These results show, and some people were asked a question, the League Inner Survey, and I, I posted that online too. I think it's important. And you can actually do the, the test on, online with the, uh, the link I gave. These results show that American evangelicals and the general U.S. population are essentially equivalent in their agreement with the statement. The statement was that uh, God changes, changes of mind. Um, nearly half of the groups believe that God changes by learning and adapting. This may indicate the influence of open theism, another uh, heresy, which, God, which denies God's complete knowledge of future events, that God's not totally in control, and process theology, which is taught at Claremont, and uh, which denies God's omnipotence and asserts that he does undergo changes within the evangelical church. These findings may also indicate a lack of clear biblical teaching on the character of God in evangelical churches. Bonhoeffer believes the Bible is the record of the divine activity in human history, in real history. The Bible records these events as facts, as objective events that occurred in space and time. Because the Bible is the exclusive witness to divine revelation, it alone holds the place of authority in the church. We don't you know, just trust in, trust in church traditions which change. Noting el nothing else supplants it. Take the story of the creation in Genesis. Moses, quite obviously, was not an eyewitness of creation. But in Romans 8, 16, though, Paul says, the Spirit himself bears witness, meaning that there is a special witness of the Holy Spirit to assure us that we are the children of God. So God has decreed for his church to have skilled and gifted guides. The Word of God is a means for our sanctification, our means for growing in grace. So oh, there's so much, so much treasure in this book. How to read the Bible. He really talks about the practice of reading scripture, which I can't go into now. It's just we're, we're already over time. But, um, uh, okay, finishing up, we had the memory verse. Um, that is for you. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. I think one of the, one of the things that Bonhoeffer did is he'd take just one scripture a week. And I think we can do this here because we put a memory verse up. He said, Meditate on that memory verse for a whole week. See what God teaches you through his word. He'll bring light into that. Um, the hymn of the week is, I have decided to follow Jesus. That's talking about radical. It's an Indian hymn. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And also, there's another, is a, and I posted this so I won't go into detail, but once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide. And it was um, written by James R. Lowell. He's, he's a professor of modern languages and, um, and literature and succeeded as the poet, poet, Lord, poet Longfellow at, at Harvard University. And, and so he's talking about the present crisis, which we seem to always be in. And I just recommend, just read the poem. It's a fantastic poem. But one of the end, I won't, I'll read the, the end stanza, stanza. Backward look across the ages and beacon, moment see that at, like peaks of some sunk continent just jet through oblivion sea. Not an ear in court or market for the low, for, for boding cry. 
of those crises, God's stern winnowers, from whose feet earth's chaff must fly, never shows a choice momentous till the judgment has passed by. He says, We see dimly in the present what is small and what is great. So of faith, how weak an arm may turn the iron helm of fate. But the soul is still oracler amid the market's din. And it talks about um, the side with truth is noble when we share her wretched crust. Ere her cause bring fame and for profit, it is prosperous to be just. Then it is the brave man chooses while the coward stands aside, doubting his abject spirit till his Lord is crucified. Count me over earth's chosen heroes. There were souls that stood alone, while the men they agonized for hurled the, the contemptuous stone, stood serene, and down the future saw the golden, mean, golden beam incline by the side of perfect justice, mastered by their faith divine, by one man's plain truth to manhood, by the light of burning heretics, Christ's beating, bleeding feet I track, toiling up new calvaries ever with a cross that turns not back. And these mal- mounts of anguish number how each generation learned one new word of the grand credo, which in prophet hearts hath burned. Uh, it just, it's a powerful, it's a long poem, but I, I highly recommend it. Well, let's close in prayer. I'm going to read Spiritual Helps from Valley Vision. Our eternal Father, it is amazing love that Thou dost send Your Son to suffer in our stead, that Thou hast added the Spirit to teach, comfort, guide, that Thou hast allowed the ministry of angels to wall us round. All heaven serves the welfare of a poor worm. Perhaps permit Thy unseen servants to be ever active on my behalf, on our behalf, and to rejoice when grace expands in us. Suffer them never to rest until our conflict is over, and stands victorious on salvation shore. Grant that my proneness to evil, deadness to good, resistance to thy spirit's motions may never provoke thee to abandon us. May our hard heart awaken thy pity, not thy wrath. And if the enemy gets an advantage through our corruption, let it be seen that heaven is mightier than hell, that those for me are greater than those against me. Arise to help in richness of covenant blessings. Keep us feeding in the pastures of thy strengthening word, searching scripture to find you there. If our waywardness is visited with a scourge, enable us to receive correction meekly, to bless the reproving hand, to discern the motive of rebuke, to respond promptly and do the first work. Let all thy fatherly fatherly dealings make us a partaker of your holiness. Grant that that in every fall we may sink lower on our knees, and that when we rise, we may be to, to loftier heights of devotion. May, may we make, may every cross be sanctified, every loss a gain, every denial a spiritual advantage, every dark nut day a light of the Holy Spirit, every night of trial, trial a song. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we pray for this year for all of us, Lord, that you would teach us and guide us and help us to do your work with, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Bless each one's family, their relationships, um, their work, and their study of your word. Help them be disciplined on a daily basis. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, it's been great. Have a great week.